Hi everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you're dialing in from. Thank you very much for joining us on this webinar, Data Privacy and Protection in International Law, which is being jointly organized by the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore and also the International Law Association Singapore branch. Uh, before I hand you over to your moderator, Derek Lowe, for today, uh, just a couple of administrative remarks. Uh, this is a 90-minute session. We will have a lively panel discussion followed by a question and answer session. Uh, we encourage you to type any questions you may have into the chat function, perhaps in the course of the panel discussion, uh, where the panelists and moderator will be able to see them and subsequently will be able to respond to your questions. Uh, during the panel discussion, please remember to turn off your videos and microphones uh, so that it doesn't interrupt the panel discussion. I will now hand you over to uh, Derek, the moderator for today, who will introduce all our eminent panelists. Derek, please. Thanks very much, Matthew. Um, good, good afternoon, everyone in Singapore, and good morning, good evening to those who are joining us from different time zones. My name is Derek Lowe, and I am a Deputy Director General at the International Affairs Division of the AGC Singapore, and a Council Member of the Singapore Branch of the ILA. It is my great pleasure to welcome you uh, to, to, to today's webinar on data privacy and protection in international law. Uh, I think Matthew has mentioned that this webinar is jointly organized by the Singapore branch of the ILA and the NUS Center for International Law. It is also supported by the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore. Uh, it is the first webinar that the Singapore branch of the ILA is organizing this year. And just want to say that we will be organizing an another one soon so please look out for the publicity material. Before we begin, let me set the scene for this webinar. We live in an age where digital technologies have come to touch almost every aspect of modern day life. Today, we spend as much time online as we do offline. Schools have gone online with virtual lessons as a result of the pandemic. We find recreation and entertainment through web serving and music or video streaming services. Uh, business activities have gone live for many years now, and even government services are going or have gone digital. Now, as a re result of this, a large amount of data is generated every day. Analyzing this data will allow one to gain insights that can reap benefits for businesses and even society as, at large. For example, uh, knowing your customers' online behavior uh, will help businesses to cater to their needs and preferences. At the same time, analyzing uh, large chunks of data can lead to new innovations uh, and services, as well as provide solutions to some of the problems that societies face today. Another feature of the digital age is that uh, the data generated often does not stay within borders, uh, but it is uh, transmitted or stored overseas because of the interconnected world that we live in, because uh, now we live in the age of a data economy. All of this raises privacy and security concerns for individuals, businesses, and governments, uh, because information is the new goal and uh, it can be extracted, exploited, and misused. So the questions that we are exploring today uh, are what are the international rules governing data privacy and protection? Are the rules adequate or are they in need of reform? Do the rules restrict or do they support legitimate business activity? And can the rules be future-proof uh, even as new technology brings along new capability uh, but also uh, new challenges? Against this background, I am pleased to introduce our four distinguished panelists today who will be exploring some of these issues. First, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Jovan Kabalia, who will be speaking on the current state of international law governing data privacy and protection. He is the executive director of the Diplo Foundation and the head of the Geneva Internet Forum. In 2018 and 2019, he served as the co-executive director of the UN Secretary General's uh, high-level panel on digital cooperation, which was co-chaired by Jack Maher and Melinda Gates. The high-level panel explored a broad range of issues concerning digital cooperation, including some of the very same ones that we are uh, discussing today. Next, we have Ms. Boyana Bellamy, 
who will be uh, discussing the topic from the perspective of the EU. She will be covering the rules and developments in the EU and US, including the GDPR and Privacy Shield. She is the president of Hunton Andruskas, LLP's Center for Information Policy Leadership, uh, which is a preeminent global information policy think tank. She was one of 20 privacy experts to participate in the Transatlantic Privacy Bridge Project that sought to develop practical solutions to, the bridge, uh, to bridge the gap between European and US privacy regimes. Uh, third, we have Mr. Rajesh Srinivasan, who heads the media technology and telco practice of Raja and Tan Singapore. Uh, and this uh, firm has been at the forefront, or rather he has been at the forefront of, leader, uh, of legal policy and regulatory matters uh, relating to technology, cybersecurity, data protection, and more in the region. He will discuss the data privacy framework in APRAC and some of the challenges that multinational businesses operating in the region face. And finally, we have Associate Professor Warren Chick of the SMU, who is the Director of the Center for AI and Data Governance. He will discuss the impact of new and emer uh, emerging technology on data protection and whether the existing rules need to be adapted. He will also consider the future changes to the global data protection regime. Before I hand the time to our panelists, I would just like to uh, remind again that after each present, or rather just to inform you that after each presentation, uh, the other panelists will be invited to uh, give their immediate reactions uh, to the presentation that they just uh, heard. There will, however, be opportunity for our participants to post questions directly to the panelists after the four presentations. You can do so by turning your, on your mics, actually, or if you prefer, you can also send them in, in writing using the chat function, and I will post them on their behalf. So without further ado, uh, may I invite uh, Professor Jovan to, to give the first presentation, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Uh, and it's really great to be today with uh, our colleagues, uh, mainly from Singapore, but also other countries. And thank you for inviting me to participate today. We have a lot of in common. Uh, in addition to weather, apparently it's raining in London, in Geneva, where I'm connecting from, and uh, Singapore. And the main uh, aim of uh, my uh, short uh, intro will be to put the broader context on, uh, for our discussion today on uh, international law and data governance. Uh, last two years, I've been involved in discussions at the United Nations on the question of uh, uh, internet digital governance. There are various prefixes. In, in all of those discussions, data has been underlying question. That whatever you discuss, security, privacy, human rights, AI, you come to the, to the data. Now, what I'm going to do uh, now is to just give you a quick uh, context about, about this discussion. And I will share the, you, I will disappear from the screen and you will see virtual background with uh, some information about, uh, about uh, what has been discussed and uh, why the Secretary General established the UN High Level Panel on Digital Cooperation, which was co-chaired by Jack Ma and Melinda Gates. One of his main aims uh, was to see what can be done on the question of uh, digital governance, sort of discussing the new digital social contract. We are facing a lot of uh, challenges. Some issues can be resolved, some issues cannot be resolved. Therefore, he gathered uh, 20 experts led by Jack Ma and Melinda Gates. And we spent one year discussing uh, both philosophical issues uh, from the Confucius and the other philosopher, Aristotle, Plato, but also very practical issues. Therefore, that was that connection between broader reflections and very practical reflections, which are, I guess, of the paramount importance for our discussion today. It is a very simple question, whom we call if we want to resolve our digital problems legal policy, you name it and you have it. Do we call, do, if we have a phishing attack, do we, do we call a local, local police station? Do we call legal office? Uh, who can answer our questions? Unfortunately, in, even in well-organized societies, which I guess uh, are uh, uh, legally well-organized society like Singapore or Switzerland, it is difficult to find this phone number or address or person whom to address. Therefore, the huge challenge 
for lawyers, policymakers, and diplomats is to make this uh, image functional. Therefore, that was one of the main guiding principles. And we argued that there is a need to create some sort of digital home for humanity, very decentralized space where people can address their digital issues, especially issues which are uh, cross, uh, cross border or uh, inter, as it was in, indicated by Derek, interdisciplinary in their nature. And you can imagine how wide this discussion was from cybersecurity, development, human rights, AI. But one of the underlying issues has been the question of the legal regulation of data. And in our discussion, we more or less centered and came to the few aspects of data, which is the question of the economic aspects, security, human rights, and technical aspects of data. We also uh, came relatively clear to realizing that you cannot discuss data governance as just one issue. There are huge differences between uh, personal data, industrial data, data as a public good. And that was one of the call of the panel to have data, data as a public good. Therefore, this is the first, let's say, possible uh, challenge or idea for our discussion today how to uh, deal with different type of, uh, of data in, uh, when it comes to the legal regulation. Second point was the question of applicability of existing law. And here the famous statement is that we need a new law for the internet, you know, the old dilemma of the horse law. But the more we have been analyzing, the more we have, we have been uh, realizing that existing law, especially on the national level, can address quite a few challenges from the perspective of human rights, consumer protection, cybersecurity. Therefore, one of the advices is to exist, to use existing tools on national, regional level, and an international level. And we may discuss how functional and how robust are these tools on the international level. And the last point, which is uh, extremely important for uh, small countries like Switzerland or Singapore, is the question of the real politic around data. The notion, metaphor or data as oil came deep into the psyche of decision makers. This is the asset. And now the countries which much, with much bigger population are increasingly arguing that they want to acquire this asset. And it puts countries which, are, which depend on international cooperation like uh, Switzerland and, uh, and Beck and Switzerland and Singapore in rather difficult, difficult position. Now it is a challenge which I'm sure the Singapore can't, small countries, countries which are open to international cooperation will be facing a lot. In that discussion, one issue which came high on the policy and agenda was a relatively simple. Does the cyberspace exist? I've been arguing strongly with my legal background that uh, it doesn't exist because for many reasons, but I always use metaphor, you can have a cyber crime, but you don't have a cyber jail. Therefore, the point is that we have also to in increase the clarity and the legal clarity can help when there are uses of the terms like uh, cyberspace. All transactions on the internet, all data movements of the internet are ultimately under some jurisdiction. Even if you have this, my call going on the, on the seabed cables, ultimately these seabed cables are under some jurisdiction. Therefore, in brief, there is this broader discussion, pivotal question, philosophical challenges that we have to address, but also very practical challenges, whom to call, when you want to address legal, security, human rights, and other aspects of uh, data governance or digital governance in general. And this would be my proposition for discussion today, to open both conceptual issues that will shape our work and work of legal community, but also to go into a bit of nitty gritties of the, of the application of existing law, uh, the gaps that exist on the national regional and global level, and seeing how we can uh, uh, adjust existing law 
and fill the gaps when they are needed, especially in the neighboring concepts to the data, which is artificial intelligence. This would be just a quick uh, intro, and I'm really looking forward to, to uh, interesting, uh, thought-provoking and engaging discussion. Over to you, Derek. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor. And, and uh, <clears throat> I thought it was a very uh, good overview you said of the, of, the, uh, of the international law regime and the framework and the point that, uh, you know, that, that actually there's existing law that covers specific aspects of it. Uh, but also there are gaps. At this time, uh, perhaps uh, I'd like to invite the other panelists. Do you have any uh, immediate thoughts to what you just heard from, from uh, Professor Jovan? Uh, maybe, maybe I'll start the ball rolling. Um, I've got two questions actually, or rather I had two questions, but now I have one. And, and my first question was really, is there such a thing as a cyberspace? And I think you've answered that uh, because Ultimately, data uh, resides in a server somewhere, and the server therefore, and the data therefore, will be subject to uh, the jurisdiction of the state. Uh, the other question which I, I had uh, was um, ownership. Who who owns the data? Uh, in particular, does anyone own personal data? Short answer, Derek is yes data is asset, uh, the bit longer uh, the discussion is what type of three aspects of the data in from the Roman law, usus, fructus, abusus, what these three aspects of the proprietary context are applicable to data. How can we use it? How can we discard, uh, uh, discard it, sell it? Now, what we are seeing in the court cases increasingly in the United States court practice is the data is considered increasingly as asset in the, in the situation of bankruptcy or a sort of merger of companies. Now, while we lawyers are uh, discussing the question of the nature of data, the practice is emerging gradually that the, at least uh, one of the these three aspects, usus fructus abusus, is emerging as a proprietary, proprietary aspect. This, on the policy level, this discussion will have uh, really far-reaching consequences. There is a strong school which argues that uh, data cannot be considered as a, prop, uh, a property, that there is no ownership over data. Um, and that would be an interesting to discuss today. Over to you. Thanks. And uh, Boyana, sorry, I, I thought that... Yes. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. And it was great to uh, hear these uh, provo tough provoking um, uh, comments by Jovan. Uh, Kurvalia and a and, um, couple of comments. So I'm absolutely, I agree with Jovan that there has been this narrative around data is oil and you know when you see the economist front page saying data is the new oil um, and that's how everybody does starts behaving, you know, governments, companies and so on. But I actually think that a more interesting narrative that we should be deploying is to say actually data is new environment. Um, and here is why I say that, because data is not oil. It's not just, it's not something you kind of exploit and then you don't have enough of. In fact, data should be like new environmental protection because we need to make sure that data, um, there is data in the ecosystem, that data is accessible to all countries, to, uh, you know, uh, South and, 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 and emerging economies, the data is more accessible to a majority of the companies as well, not just perhaps the large multinationals as, as well. And so, and also very importantly, organizations, and I will talk about that, organizations need to think about how do we protect data? How do we make sure we also have the data in the system? So how do we have a framework for protecting data, which actually makes sure that it is sustainable long term. And that's really all about trust, um, based on trust with individuals, with society, with investors, with politicians and regulators. And I think that those organizations who see data as beyond just asset, but it's about digital responsibility, sustainability, ensuring we actually have data for the future, um, I think that they're going to be much, uh, uh, much ahead. So I completely agree the narrative about the oil. I just think we have to move on um, to kind of data as a kind of almost environmental protection. We have to protect, 
sustain, nourish, and ensure that it remains, it stays. Thank you very much, Brianna. And I'm just wondering uh, whether we have any uh, quick thoughts from the other panelists. Uh, yeah, oh, uh, right, Rajas can go first. <laughs> Thanks for that, Warren. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to add on another layer, if I may, uh, on, and specifically on the issue of ownership. Uh, that there is this challenge today where there is uh, individuals who obviously assert in, uh, ownership over their personal data, but there are also states that are seeking to assert an interest over the data of their citizens, which I thought was an interesting thing for us to consider, and I'll be touching on some of that later on when we look at this issue of principle that data localization, etc. It's a very populist move but uh, with very serious consequences uh, if we were to go down that road. So I'll be very interested to hear any thoughts on that and I'll share more later. Thanks. Yeah, I, I just have uh, two points. Uh, one is re regarding the issue of uh, properization of data. I think I uh, agree there's a lot been, that's been written on this. There are two schools of thought. Um, at the end of the day, really, um, you know, it, it's, it's what we, we consider to be data. I mean, I think the focus here is really we have to talk about personal data itself. Right? And there's a lot of principles and concepts in data protection law that already uh, provides the individual, the data, uh, the data subject, some control over it. And I think the argument over property takes away the, the fact that what we are actually concerned with is control over personal data. And if we say that we already have that control over it, then I think we can avoid the whole doctrinal discussion on propertization. Um, and, and, and this is what this, 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 this issue was actually considered by the Law Reform Committee and SAL itself. Right, and they came up with the report, uh, Rethinking data Database Rights and Data Ownership, uh, I think in July this year, and they rejected the notion that, okay, we should consider it as property. So why don't we just move away from discussing, um, is it property or not? Because there's a lot of things about property that doesn't fit very well with, uh, with digital information and especially personal data, uh, especially if you think about it from the, the EU perspective where personal data is, you know, is there's the human rights as a component to it. So how do you reconcile the human rights uh, component to it, to the fact that you treat it as a property, they seem to sort of, you know, uh, conflict with one another. So if you move away from that and let's talk about control, uh, and then there's a lot to, that we can discuss. And I think that we're going to discuss it a little bit more later on as well. And the other thing that is, is uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm personally am interested to know uh, whether there's any plans, uh, you know, in, in the UN or in any other international body to take more control over uh, the, the, the sort of the global trends and the, ha sort of harmonizing the global trends in personal data, because you've seen it done regionally, right? The EU definitely have done it. Uh, APEC is going to, and Roger's going to talk about it. APEC is also trying to, uh, to, trying to find more harmonization in terms of principles and especially in data flows. But I think we need a global, uh, sort of a global leader in this. And I wonder whether there's any, you know, uh, any news about, about that and whether, um, whether uh, Jovan can, can, can maybe let us know whether there's any plans for that. Yes, I think uh, Joe wanted to have, uh, give him the right of reply because I thought that he wanted to respond to a comment earlier. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for great comments. Uh, I cannot agree more with, uh, 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 with Boyana to extend this oil metaphor to environment. And it's also a also nice, nice extension of a reduced view and this broader view of protecting our digital environment. Uh, like we have a natural, now digital environment is based on data. Now, uh, I'm afraid that with this real politic phase in the digital policy, this argument is still weak, but it doesn't mean that uh, one shouldn't work on it. The oil argument is, is to the large extent uh, prevailing, and it brings me to Rajesh's uh, comment on the data localization. It is happening uh, uh, on all levels, and if you really analyze TikTok case, for example, the whole TikTok movement, it is to the large extent data localization uh, exercise. Now, you can have uh, the, the US uh, digital diplomats arguing for the free flow of data, but then when you come, come to, the, to the TikTok controversy and WeChat controversy, it is not about free flow of data. It's about data localization. And it brings me to the third point which, uh, which Warren brought is, is uh, that uh, the real uh, test is when the court the cases come to the court. We can discuss, we can have a commissions, we can have reports, we can do, I love lecturing and uh, having philosophical dis the discussion, but when judge has to rule, he or she has to make uh, a clear judgment. 
And this is what, why, how the European Court of Justice shaped the digital law, I would say more than UN, more than European Commission, more than Facebook or any other company. Through the SRAM uh, the judgments, through the judgments in the case of Uber, and you, you are familiar with all the judgments. Therefore, that is, that is the point where the judges have to fit legal complexity in their legal thinking. And we at Diplo have been providing training for judges to understand difference when it comes. But this is sort of a reality check and the point where academic and policy discussion uh, face, the, face the legal theories. And I'm afraid on this point, asset proprietary arguments are a bit stronger than what I personally agree with you, the, the, other, the other logic that data is not considered as asset. At the UN level, uh, as a, re a result of the, of the panel, there is an initiative to have data as a global public, uh, to have certain type of data as a global digital commons, like climate data, like shareable data and the, the other, other elements and to strengthen the Human Rights Council, to strengthen the other organizations to be more robust in addressing the human rights, security, and other aspects of the data. Personally, I'm not anymore with the UN, and, uh, but also when I was in the UN, I was a bit skeptical about, about uh, this aspect, especially for small countries like Singapore and Switzerland, the question of protection of the rules of law, international law, is of utmost importance. And I guess, and this, this is the reason why Singapore is very active on international level to, to, do, to do it. And more than one comment, and I would add, with this I will close this uh, uh, reply. Uh, have a look at the, at the la latest European uh, State of Europe address by the President of the European Commission. What was almost shocking is, and it was long pledoyé to European parliamentarians, that she didn't mention one single time GDPR. And her speech was on, about industrial data. One can argue the GDPR problem is, uh, is resolved, but it was such a strong focus on industrial data. And as you know, EU is a trendsetter in data policy. Therefore, we may have some new winds coming from Brussels. Over to you, Derek. Thank, thanks, uh, Professor. And I think this is a very good time for us to segue into uh, Boyana's um, uh, presentation, because as you mentioned, the EU is a trendsetter for data protection. And so uh, if I could just invite her to uh, briefly present on the EU perspective. Boyana, please. Thank you, Derek. And uh, good afternoon, good morning, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, I'm dialing in from uh, my home in London, um, locked down, just like everybody else. But really, really, this is fantastic discussion already in the first half an hour. So I look forward to the rest as well. Um, so what I'd like to do is just uh, um, build on what we have heard from Jovan. He's given us this kind of geopolitical broader perspective, but let me now dive a little bit more on what the regulation for data protection and data privacy looks like. And in fact, at international level, uh, to Warren's point, we do have some um, international covenants, um, such as the uh, Europe, um, uh, the OECD uh, guidelines, of course, which have been um, uh, passed in 80s, but are now being reviewed um, again and have been reviewed in 2013. So it's, it's, it's an interesting um, legal text that actually sets also the scene as to what the protection of personal data looks like. And interestingly, they may be even dealing with some of the governmental access to data and data localization within the current review cycle as well. And then of course we have the Council of Europe Convention 108 that has been modernized last year. So they call it Co Co Council of Con Council of Europe Convention 108 plus now, that is kind of becoming quite um, uh, important and influential. And there are 55 signatories, but it, of course it isn't global as well. And we, as I'm going to be talking about, we do see quite a number of different regulatory models when it comes to data protection. Of course, one is led by Europe, as Jovan has said, Europe is trendsetter when it comes to data protection. Um, GDPR uh, is the new uh, law of the land. It's a comprehensive model. It applies to all data, all personal data in all sectors. So public sector bodies, private companies, NGOs processing personal data. 
um, it applies to all personal data, data of employees, data of website users, data of business contacts. So it's a really comprehensive horizontal law. And it also regulates how data is collected, used, shared, transferred across the border. So uh, regulation of data transfer is a feature of this law as well. And in Europe, <clears throat> because of the uh, uh, Lisbon Treaty, we have got Europe uh, data protection as a fundamental right. And that is indeed what has been clouding uh, lots of judgments and lots of uh, um, the way the regulators and courts are interpreting this right. Once you elevate it to the fundamental human right, it then becomes uh, at a par with the right like freedom of expression uh, or, or indeed any other rights as well. And there's been lots of discussion, for example, uh, recently in the COVID situation, again, you know, how do we ensure a right to life and right to medical um, uh, progress and now economic growth as well with this sort of fundamental right of data privacy and data protection. So there's been a lot of debate in Europe around anything from uh, contact um, track and trace apps to return to work and monitoring people as well. <clears throat> and of course, as you know, the European Court of Justice has also had a chance to look at uh, uh, how the fundamental right to data protection relates to, to the right of uh, freedom of expression in its seminal Coster judgment. Um, and that was the case of right to be forgotten. As you know, Google um, uh, search uh, engine was uh, taken, if you like, to court um, after the Supreme Court of Europe, European Court of Justice, where the court sort of declared that there is this right to be forgotten. Uh, but of course, the court did balance um, the right for freedom of expression and the right to, you know, disseminate knowledge with that right of data protection as well. Um, uh, then, of course, um, apart from GDPR, we have got sort of U.S. Uh, model, which is different model. It is not true that U.S. does not have privacy laws. It does. It's just differently regulated. It's very much regulated at sectoral level. So, you know, you would have uh, Health Data Protection Act. You would have um, uh, financial services protection, data protection law. Um, and, of course, now states, U.S. states are all mushrooming with new data protection laws. So we have got California, uh, we've got a state data security laws as well. And there's a big discussion about the need to have a comprehensive data privacy law in the US, but that is of course um, difficult to achieve politically, economically in the US. It certainly is not a fundamental right. It's much more seen as a question of uh, deceptive and unfair trade practices. And therefore, we have got a very strong regulator, Federal Trade Commission, that actually um, does regulate data protection, but through the unfair and deceptive uh, use uh, or abuse, as, as, as um, uh, um, Jovan talked about, of data. And even data security is seen as unfair uh, practice. Um, uh, staying in North America, we have Canadian system, which is something in between Europe and U, uh, US. It is, of course, um, uh, it's a hybrid model. It's based on accountability of organizations and accountability for data transfers as well. Um, and there are federal, provincial laws. It's, uh, and of course, they are also signatories to the APEC cross border privacy rules, just like um, uh, uh, US is. And I think it's important to mention that this APEC cross border privacy rules, I know Raja is going to speak more about that, but, but it, it's an interesting model where the APEC economies are creating a single set of kind of common level denominator rules. And then every companies who are who adhere to this model can be certified and then they can share data globally. Very interesting model as well. And it's kind of growing, I think, in importance vis-a-vis uh, -vis Europe, but of course it's nothing as prevalent as GDPR. And in Asia, of course, we have got a um, plethora of different laws. There isn't such a thing as Asian uh, data protection system, but of course India now passing uh, its law. Thailand has done it as well. And then finally, Latin America, um, very much copying sort of GDPR style, and now more and more African nations as well. Um, now, of course, that all brings us to kind of this big situation of, of complete legal fragmentation. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have single rules, and that makes it very difficult 
for global organizations, but also technology to travel across the borders. I believe that data is really globally, uh, um, uh, glo global uh, technology and business processes are global. We need to ensure as much as possible this um, uh, global data flows and global, um, uh, globally uh, convergent, dare I say, rules. Um, I know Derek has asked me to consider a little bit about the impact of GDPR on international law, and there are kind of maybe two comments I'd like to make. Interestingly, GDPR, like many data protection laws, is extraterritorial. So it doesn't just apply to European citizens, so it doesn't just apply to European EU companies, it actually applies to any, any company globally that actually um, uh, offers goods and services to EU citizens or monitors EU citizens' behaviors through cookies, for example, right? But it could be any other way of tracking online behavioral advertising as well. So, so it's really interesting because the question then becomes that we have this not only diverging laws, but we have got conflict of laws where single uh, uh, processing, a single activity uh, out of Singapore or Asia can be actually regulated both by Asian um, uh, countries' data protection law, Singapore data protection law, but also GDPR because of this extraterritorial uh, effect. And it's really important that organizations do look at this. And it, you might have seen there's been a number of the big U.S. Um, uh, uh, media companies and publications who actually have blocked access to their websites like LA Times and Chicago, newspapers more regional than kind of, if you like, U.S., uh, they blocked access to the European citizens because they kind of said, we don't actually want European citizens to um, access our websites because we do serve cookies and we can't comply with GDPR and we don't want to comply with GDPR, which is kind of interesting in this kind of global day and age that things like that actually happen. The second interesting thing about GDPR is that it has got this kind of way of regulating data transfers and it talks about um, uh, 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 data can only flow uh, and be transferred to countries that has got adequate level of data protection. Or there are some other alternative data transfer mechanisms that can be put in place. Now that means that in some ways this adequacy um, decision-making impacts the rest of the world. So EU is actually making decisions whether a third country law is adequate or not. And I think that's an interesting, it's got kind of interesting political dimension to it. And these decisions are very political, right? They haven't been, um, they're not just legal decisions uh, where you kind of compare, uh, but, but it's quite superficially legally done, but it's very political. So as you know, EU has declared about 12 countries adequate, including Israel or Canada, uh, Argentina, but very recently Japan. And of course, those decisions are going to be now all reviewed because of this new Schrems ruling that I will mention um, uh, in, in a few moments as well. So that's kind of the GDPR's impact on, on global world. Now, I talked a lot about the need to ensure, and I think Jovan has, has talked about data flows. Um, this is something that data protection rules, laws regulate. They all regulate transfers of data across borders. And um, I kind of think this is the time now that we have to revisit this again, not just because of the Schrems ruling, but also because we do need to ensure as much as possible um, free but responsible and accountable flows of data. Every possible um, research from McKinsey's to uh, uh, European uh, Internet uh, Institute and, and Institute for International Economics and Politics in, Euro in Brussels also talk about the value of data flows. Data flows have actually surpassed, data flows in digital uh, data and digital flows are surpassing the flow of goods and uh, by, by tenfold. And they are the ones who, that are actually driving the rise of GDP. So that's what's so important. 80% of startups are born, born global. So they need to ensure access to data and ability to share and exchange data. And Warren is going to be talking about the need for AI uh, to have these masses of data to be actually competitive and for R&D. So we need more data flows as, as much responsible and we trust. And that was interesting that G20 uh, last year in Japan took data flows as its central point, right? Uh, uh, then Prime Minister uh, Abe 
talked about data flows with trust. And, and, and it is something that, you know, I particularly feel passionate about and lots of the work that we at SIPL do is all um, geared towards ensuring that we have got responsible ways of uh, uh, using data across borders as well. And there are many ways to do that, of course, through uh, APEC cross border privacy rules, through binding corporate rules, um, uh, standard contractual clauses and standard contracts as well. And of course, ensuring this that accountability flows with data. But yes, Schrems judgment did actually put a big question mark in all of this. For those of you who may not have heard about this, is that in July uh, this year, European Court of Justice, just like Jovan has said, has really uh, shaken our legal privacy community, but also broader digital trade and governmental communities. European Court of Justice has ruled that um, Privacy Shield, which was a bilateral adequate, this adequacy decision and, and transfer mechanism between EU and US, uh, has been invalidated again for the second time after Safe Harbor because um, the U US does not uh, uh, provide for essential equivalent protection to fundamental right of data protection that we do in Europe here, particularly because of the governmental use of data, the surveillance laws um, in the US, and in, in particular, disproportionate surveillance laws, disproportionate use of data, and secondly, the lack of judicial redress. So what the court has said is that now, as and when companies want to share data, as and when the EU makes these adequacy decisions, very importantly, another consideration is not just what the rule of law looks like in, a, in the a third country, but actually what, the, what does the rule of law in respect of governmental access to data look like? Is that access proportionate? Is it uh, necessary and um, democratically framed by law? And is there importantly judicial redress against that access? Now, as you're listening to this, I hope you are kind of thinking, wow, well, is there another country that actually can uh, raise the bar to be ever uh, considered adequate by EU standard? I mean, this is the problem that we have now. Frankly, I, do, I, I dare say difficult potentially Japan, because that adequacy decision has already been made and that high bar has been looked at, but everybody else, no. And now companies in Europe are going to have to make these assessments of third countries before they share data, right? And make the, the decision whether they're going to proceed or not, and then maybe uh, adopt some risk mitigation measures, some supplementary measures to whatever they can do limit and curtail that governmental access to data and that risk that the court talks about and to provide that essential equivalency. Incredibly hard. So the whole basis on which data is going to be flowing from Europe and around the world is really um, shaky at the moment. And I honestly, honestly do hope that other countries do not copy Schrems decision because if we have this bilaterally, it, there will no be data flows anymore because governmental access to data is incredibly difficult to regulate. It's very political and maybe there is a need to regulate this as well to discuss and OECD is starting to do that. But at the moment, it's very difficult. And I think European companies have been dealt a very difficult um, set of cards. So this is really what's um, keeping us a lot awake at night. Some other things that, um, and this is my last uh, comment, that, that companies and businesses are considering now is, um, of course, it is becoming more geopolitical. We have more data localization requirements, data flows are more uh, regulated as well. Um, um, but also there is a conf conflation between competition law and data protection law. Having more data is also becomes a dominant a potentially abuse of dominant position. So we are seeing this kind of new uh, um, uh, legal battle opening between competition law and uh, data protection law and even consumer law as well. And then of course, we are all looking um, with lots of interest uh, where the discussions on AI are going to go. Um, AI and machine learning, and we at CIPL have been doing lots of work in this uh, um, area writing papers on this tension between data protection and AI and what the solutions may look like. But Europe is looking to regulate AI. There are some proposals for 
again, horizontal regulation of both personal data and industrial data use of AI by the Commission. Uh, and again, you know, you may say Europe may set the standard here. I fear a little bit that this is a little bit over, -regu over regulation, and I worry that Europe may lose that lose that competitive edge uh, that it really very much needs vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis US. So this this. The new space race on, for AI is really um, uh, something that is actually uh, uh, becoming a part of our, our debates. Um, and companies are all in between these rocks and hard places, these conflicts of laws, fragmentation of data protection rules, the new data localization requirements, curtailing of, of, of AI as well as data flows. And I think the only way to think about this is actually to elevate data protection to the board level issue. And this is something we are working on very much with organizations that are CIPL members and others. We are promoting accountability and corporate digital responsibility as a way forward because it's all about trust. Uh, it's all about sustainability of data. It's about ensuring that we as companies are seen as good corporate citizens. Uh, and that we can share data globally because we are accountable, that we can engage in AI because we are trusted. And we also have got, you know, programs and tools and privacy uh, and data security management programs that are set at the high level, board level, that actually uh, operationalize all these complex legal rules into everyday practices. And I actually think this accountability and corporate digital responsibility is something that we should be focusing on I think it's something that regulators and policymakers should be incentivizing. And I know Singapore Privacy Data Protection Commissioner, IMD as well, the, the, the ministry is very much thinking those ways, right? Those organizations that are accountable, digitally responsible, should be able to engage more. They should be allowed to do more with data. They should be allowed to share data. So I'm very hopeful that this notion uh, is something that we can actually build on. So Derek, a little bit longer intro, but I hope that was setting the scene um, for kind of what the rest of the world looks like. Thank, thank you, Anna. That was certainly very interesting. Um, I'd like to um, uh, save a uh, little more time for, for question and answers for participants later. So maybe uh, we, unless there are uh, any uh, burning desires from our panelists to respond to what Brianna has mentioned, uh, I, I think maybe we can just go on to Rajesh. But before I, we, we hand time to Rajesh, I just thought that uh, what Brianna mentioned about the EU, a data protection of privacy being a fundamental right in the EU uh, has really um, created some friction or tension or you call it over-regulation and this has caused uh, issues in the rest of the world and, and I think uh, Rajesh will be sharing some of the challenges that his clients face in the Asia Pacific. Uh, Rajesh, please. Uh, thanks, thanks for that, Derek. Um, and as, since I have the, the, the option to be the next speaker, I would also maybe use the chance to comment on one or two points that I made. Thank you, uh, Brianna. It was a very interesting presentation as well. Super uh, summary of the core issues. And one of the challenges that, that we have, which will segue nicely into my presentation, is the fact that um, for us as practitioners, the challenge I've seen is clients need to share data uh, on a very practical level. Uh, and that happens these days because data models are critical to everything from designing the business case uh, to be able to, to uh, provide services in a personalized manner based on the client's needs, et cetera, all of which sound at the same time super exciting and super scary to the average person. Uh, Over-personalization, et cetera, that's happening. My, daughter, uh, my daughter's uh, favorite bedtime story is being read to her every night, freaks me out by Alexa, but Alexa gets better and better at doing that every night. Uh, makes me feel redundant. Uh, these are, these are, are real-life challenges that, that, that we're all facing today. So in that context, uh, what I hope to share today um, is, is to put in a little bit more uh, color on the issue of data localization and cross-border data transfer. Uh, another point that was raised, I think it's important from a, uh, from a sharing standpoint, is that there is a lot of confluence of interest between the interests of the individual and the in interest of, of the state. Uh, and I say that in particular because uh, there is this belief that the state can speak on behalf of individuals with regard to their personal data. This is a trend that you'll notice in particular in, in Asia and the various pieces of legislation that are taken through, unfortunately seems to mirror this, this, um, this approach uh, under the guise of, of uh, data localization. So I hope you can see my, my slides. Um, yeah, okay, great. 
this is an extremely worthy set of slides and the rest are unfortunately not any less worthy. So please do not attempt to read it. Uh, but I do want to just provide some context and I want to try and keep it within the, the time frame so that we can uh, have a Q&A at the end. Uh, I start first with Singapore's position with regard to data transfer. And it's no different from what you find in many other jurisdictions, although not universally uh, the same approach. Our stance essentially is that uh, we start from the prohibitory language. You can't transfer data unless the data is going to be provided and going to have uh, the same standard of protection as required under uh, Singapore PDPA, the language being specifically at least comparable to the protection under the PDPA. And if you're familiar with the Singapore Personal Data Protection Act, the standard is not in any way uh, as high a standard as some may say in certain by certain uh, barometers as of what you would find in the in the GDPR. At the same time, it's not too far off as far as the core principles are concerned. So it's not an impossible standard to achieve. Uh, having said that, the reason why a high standard is necessary is because when we look at principles or equivalents, there has to be a degree of, of acceptance that the standards are at least along the same lines as what other countries are comfortable with. Uh, and I think it's fully aware of the challenges in terms of diplomacy and trying to come up with any form of cross-border agreed position with regard to data transfer. Many have tried to basically put the issue aside, saying it's overly sensitive. Others have categorized it together with agricultural discussions, which means it's a non-starter. Uh, and, and from our standpoint, uh, data and data-related discussions at, at any national or international forum needs to be front and center uh, for the current industry to, to be able to continue working as they, as they will. And I'll explain why shortly. Uh, at the end of the day, the way in which this principle is, is achieved is by saying uh, what you see in the second bullet point, which is that the legally enforceable obligations can be in the form of A, laws, B, binding corporate rules, C, contractual obligations, uh, often called data transfer agreements, or D, legally binding instruments. All of it require a mix of contract plus statutory uh, provisions for this for this sort of model to work. And the challenge there again is that there is no standard position. In Singapore, for example, there is no standard data protection uh, or data transfer agreement that's issued by the regulator. And so everyone tries to come up with their own version. While in other jurisdictions, there is a standard template. Everyone uses it, no negotiations required. The process becomes fairly simple and, and straightforward. Uh, apart from that, um, you know, the other approach, as I said, is not so much national laws and regulations that enable data transfer. It is the fact that there are, uh, there are exercises such as what is happening at APAC with regard to the CBPR uh, and the PRP that need to also be looked at. And so again, in Singapore's context in June 2020, our regulations, the personal data protection regulations were amended such that the transfer of personal data to overseas recipients which are certified under the APAC CBPR or the PRP uh, will be satisfied, will be taken to satisfy these requirements. And I'll touch on the a little bit more about the, these two regimes uh, shortly under APAC. Um, the, the point I'm trying to make here is basically this. The APAC privacy framework seeks to try and be one of these four border arrangements. It has done a reasonably a good uh, exercise in trying to achieve what it has sought to do. It has also put in place the APAC privacy framework which has nine core privacy principles, which actually, again, mirror largely what you would find in many jurisdictions in terms of either the eight or the nine core privacy obligations, uh, accountability, prevent harm, notice, choice, collection, limitation, use of personal information, in terms of uh, managing and regulating the use, integrity of personal information, security safeguards, access and correction. So again, core principles mirror what you would find in many jurisdictions and uh, data protection rules. You would expect, therefore, that at an elemental level, people would not have concerns with the APEC privacy framework. But again, I'm generalizing because if you were to go into the specifics, there are more than enough uh, issues that, that uh, many practitioners have, have pointed out in terms of inconsistencies. But it does set a, a viable baseline. And in extent or to, ex to the extension of, of that, the, the position basically is that so long as an organization is able to show compliance with the cross-border privacy rules, uh, which are based on the APAC privacy framework, or in the case of processes, if you're able to show that you're able to satisfy two out of the nine privacy principles, i.e. compliance with the safe security safeguards and the accountability obligations under the APAC privacy framework, then you would be able to come have your data 
share and be deemed to have complied with the cross-border data, data transfer regulations in many jurisdictions, now including Singapore. Now, that, that is uh, an exercise that appears on paper to be a very good step. In practice, there are still challenges because organizations need to expense money in terms of complying with these standards. Um, and while there are 21 APEC economies um, that have endorsed the CBRP and TRP framework, in the same breath, there are only 21 countries who have endorsed the CBRP and TRP framework. Uh, and in the context of, of a global standard, where do we actually stand? Where does the CBRP um, stand? Uh, sorry, CBPR and the PRP stand in that, in that respect is a question that needs to be asked. But it is work in progress and you know, we, we live in hope that that number will increase over time. But at the end of the day, what is deemed under the regulations is that organizations that are certified under the CBPR uh, for data controllers or the PRP for data processors are deemed capable of providing an adequate standard of protection uh, to personal data. And by extension, having met those standards, then you know, the data can be deemed to be, you will deem to be someone who have met the standards and to whom data can therefore be shared from Singapore uh, without any other uh, compliance requirement to be in place. Uh, this is a brief uh, uh, image that's taken from the PDPC website, uh, which basically just shows that when you look at it from a practical standpoint in terms of application, uh, what and how PDPC views this is that when you're looking at ensuring that the recipient will provide an adequate standard of protection in compliance with the uh, standards in Singapore. You can look at any law, binding corporate rules, contractual rules, all those four, and then a new uh, limb is essentially added on, meaning CBPR or PRP certification. And that essentially is how every jurisdiction seeks to, to, to make this work. Of the 21 jurisdictions, is added on as another limb to satisfy the uh, obligations for transfer of data. So practically speaking, that's how the statutes work, how it, it gets implemented. But the reality of the situation is this, when you look at cross-border data transfer today, despite the fact that everyone's looking at it from, let's find a baseline so that there can be responsible data transfer. The reality in the market is that the, the dynamics are driven more by political imperatives, such as the need to have data of citizens stored within one's own country. Uh, you know, as a lawyer who's, who does technology, media, and telecoms, this completely baffles me, but I suppose I can see why people are saying that. Purely, if you were to take uh, the stance that, you know, people are, let's say, to use worst case scenario, being exploited in terms of misuse of their data, and therefore there's a need for the state, uh, having the mandate of the people to step in and say, no more, uh, you will only use data when I say you can use my citizens' data, otherwise that data will reside in this country. Well, that might give some relief, especially in situations where the parties that are involved in the data processing are not within your country. The reality is that the organizations within your country then potentially have a freer hand than those outside. I don't see how that necessarily protects the rights of the individual. This is particularly so in the case of data-rich jurisdictions like China or India. It's the rich only because of the fact that there's so many individuals and so much personal data that can be collected, harvested, and used. Um, and that, that essentially leads to a situation where you have uh, territorial practices in terms of data and, and uh, analytics, and the world therefore becomes poorer because these disparate pools of data analysis, analysis is not combined or cannot be combined to the betterment of, the, of all of us, of all humans in general. And I mean that in, in, in the most um, honest way I can. If you look at Singapore's position, the regulatory restrictions that such a data local, uh, localization requirement is something that we completely abhor. Uh, and we believe very strongly that it is a concerning trend. And that's been stated on, on, on many occasions, in particular by the, uh, the PDPC commissioner as early as October 2018 that what happens essentially when you uh, practice data localization is significant business costs because it leads to technical steps such as federated computing uh, or federated an uh, analysis where basically the data resides in country, but people need to create systems that run uh, data in, in an anonymized manner in some cases to the extent that that can be achieved. All the data gets processed within the country and certain data sets that are, again, not personal data, 
get shared at a, at a uh, international level. Again, that leads to, to significant business costs and it leads to a certain degree of lag. When you're dealing with artificial intelligence systems, time often, while well, not many people put in that in those exact words, time is of the essence in terms of real time data analyst, uh, an analytics. And therefore it impedes the competitiveness and the relevance of some of the AI engines that are being created in Asia that are suffering from these data localization challenges. Again, this is not something that the PPC alone uh, has, has, has pushed forward. Um, on the financial data side, our Monetary Authority of Singapore has also made it very, very clear that uh, when it comes to data localization, the issue is setting up standards and laws and regulations with regard to the pain points. So, for example, increase the, the, the issues with regard to cybersecurity regulations and other operational risks, but the data localization per se can increase cybersecurity risks and other operational risks because, for example, it creates a single repository of that data, which then makes it easier for someone who, who seeks to, to hack into the system to be able to do so. And that's starting to happen in some jurisdictions. It also uh, inhibits financial regulatory and supervisory access to information, which is happening already in terms of cross-border uh, regulatory requests for financial information. Uh, and then by extension, leads to deterioration in terms of AML, CFT, cross-border exercises and activities that are going on today. Uh, what we see as necessary, and this was stated by in the US-Singapore Joint Statement on Financial Services Data Connectivity in February this year, is that data mob mobility, specifically in the financial sector, does support economic growth and the development of innovative financial services, and it does benefit risk management and compliance program. And the way in which it's done, right, and believe me, it's not a question of the, it's not a zero sum game between the economic benefits and the protection of the data. I want that to be clear. These uh, stakeholders are not by any means saying, well, you know, data protection is important, but ABC. What they're saying is data protection is important. When it comes to cross border data protection standards, let's look at responsible and compliant data protection sharing regimes rather than a prohibition, a complete and utter prohibition of data sharing on the basis of citizenry, on the basis of nationality. Because that, co pre that concept is the one that I find very, very hard to swallow. Uh, I run a cross-border practice and you know it's difficult for me when we do projects across Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, to try and come up with a single construct with regard to data sh sharing. We come up with a, essentially a fiction of a construct, knowing full well that at some point, if this were to be challenged, I will have a hard time showing how this is truly complying with each jurisdiction's laws. And then we set up various buffers in each jurisdiction to cover that legal risk and minimize it to the extent that we can. All of which is unnecessarily expensive uh, and is very hard to replicate. The only one who wins there is me. There are lawyers who essentially have to create this very complex web of uh, compliance documentation. I'm not complaining, but then again, maybe I am. Uh, because um, it's not something that's sustainable and I believe that many SMEs and other organizations will suffer as a result of this, while the, the large organizations will always find a workaround that works for them. On, at a national level, uh, again, I'll go very quickly through this. I, I've put down some of the positions taken by in, in China. They, these are basically the laws that essentially make it so that um, you have to obtain specific permission, otherwise generally data of, uh, of Chinese need to reside in China. The same for India, data of Indians need to reside in India. Thankfully, because of significant amounts of pushback by various stakeholders, and especially because of the current uh, close relationship between the United States and, and India, um, apparently at, at, at Trump and Modi level, uh, there has been some move away from the, the hard-nosed position being taken in that country's laws. And there's certainly the departure from the August 2018 position, which mandate a, a, a very uh, severe position with regard to storage of data in country, the one where now you can store a copy of the data in country. And as long as there is a copy in country, you can still take a copy out, provided it complies with the cross-border data transfer obligations. I think that is really the middle ground that we need to try and uh, achieve. The same happened again in Indonesia, very strict on paper regulations with regard to mandating that all electronic system operators who provide public services must establish a data center in Indonesia. This is with a view that all the data must then reside in India, in Indonesia, 
to now a more nuanced position where again, you can keep a copy in Indonesia, but you can potentially bring a copy out, provided you comply with their protection standards. I want to uh, emphasize that Indonesia does not as of yet have a, uh, a full-blown data protection law in place. So data protection principles are essentially governed via government regulations like those that I've cited here. There's a draft and it'll be coming up uh, very, very shortly for further discussion. Um, Vietnam, unfortunately, it has not moved very much and their Article 26 p uh, still requires domestic and overseas providers, in this case, covering telco, the internet services, value-added services in Indonesia, to essentially collect, analyze, and process private information of users in Vietnam to retain data for requisite period of time uh, and for foreign companies to set up a branch or rep office in Vietnam for the purpose of uh, holding such data. Uh, all of which, again, makes it a bit difficult in terms of, of compliance. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and again, when you look at actually putting in place the cross-border data transfer arrangements for, for Vietnam in particular, Article 26.3 is a very hard one for us uh, to, to draft um, compliance standards. And I'll be happy to share specifics shortly. But again, in the interest of time, let me just summarize in terms of trends and paths uh, ahead. Uh, apart from the issues that I've highlighted, um, the, the concern that I have in particular is the underrepresentation of the, the country's population in data models that are being gathered uh, worldwide today. There are many data models that are being uh, collected at the healthcare level, they are being collected um, at, at the human rights level, they are being collected for various other purposes, all of which are suffering as a result of the fact that local data from certain jurisdictions are now inaccessible. Uh, on a per person basis, in some cases that, it, that la la layer of granularity is necessary, is inaccessible because of data localization laws that are put in place in such countries. And I believe that this is for makes it uh, makes the, the citizens of these countries potentially in a poorer position than in jurisdictions that accept the fact that responsible data, personal data transfer and compliant data protection cross border transfer should be per should be permitted and should be encouraged in the interest of ensuring responsible use of that data for the greater benefit of, of, of such persons. Uh, it's good to see that many countries are rolling back the hardline position, but it's still far from, from being a universal precept. It do still exist uh, in countries like Vietnam and still exist at least partially in jurisdictions like Indonesia. Uh, and again, it is political in nature, undoubtedly. Uh, it is a populist position, you know, country X data for country X, uh, and, and no one else will have access to our data. Um, you know, it's, it's good script, good, good writing, you know, wins you a few votes perhaps, but the cost, I believe, for the citizens uh, through this, um, well, uh, we're very bluntly, these false assertions uh, will, will, will be to the detriment of, of the state eventually, when the data assets and the data modeling will effectively exempt these countries. The final point I'm going to make, uh, you know, coming from a very, very small country here in Singapore, is that for jurisdictions like ours, where we do not have that rich pool of data ourselves in terms of individuals, and where we want to be seen to be uh, a data repository of sort uh, for the region and internationally, uh, it will make our business case, our um, it's somewhat of an existential argument for some major businesses in Singapore as well, including the financial sector, if data access is curtailed at the national level. And I think, again, that will be not just to the detriment of Singapore, but to the detriment of, of, of the larger population and, and the persons involved in that, in each of these specific industries. So I hope, you know, that I end that, um, you know, while people are taking these populist position, the fact that India has moved, the fact that Indonesia has moved, shows that, you know, common sense will eventually come to prevail. And that uh, this concept of state-sponsored uh, control over data will start to recede over time. Now, yeah, let's say it from my side. Thanks, thanks very much, Rajesh. Uh, and uh, what, what strikes me from the earlier presentations is that uh, countries have, have different, I mean, different countries have different approach to uh, addressing data, uh, privacy, uh, protection, and security. So on one hand, in the, in, in the EU, they've elevated it to the status of fundamental right. In other countries, they impose data localization requirements. But in both cases, you find that actually um, uh, this has, uh, has got um, uh, impact on, on the way businesses uh, operate. Uh, I thought that there's one other dimension that we should come to is that even assuming that you can, uh, uh, even assuming that you have all these protections, 
uh, I'm just wondering to what extent uh, are the rules actually uh, adequate uh, to deal with the new technology that is, is coming online? And, and here now, if I can just uh, hand the time to Warren now to, uh, for the final presentation. I must apologize, Warren, that because you are the last speaker, if you could just um, come yeah. to the key points and then you could I know what to do. Yeah, I know what to Thank do. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, actually, the, the, I, I did prepare a little bit, uh, and, and which, is, which overlaps with what has been discussed by the three uh, speakers before me. So I will just uh, excise those out of my presentation because I think that they have covered it quite well. Um, I'm just going to really focus very much on, on AI. All right, and, and so it's going to be a pivot from what was discussed earlier on. Um, and and I, I start with this quote that I have, which is, uh, and it starts, it starts with this, AI requires a vast amount of data to help train and advance its algorithm. Yet the amassing of data poses significant risks to our personal and collective freedoms. By contrast, data protection laws generally advocate minimizing the collection and retention of personal data. So the, adv the advent of AI therefore dictates a review of traditional approach in personal data protection law. So uh, suddenly it's recognized that, um, you know, with, with the greater use of technology and AI in relation to data governance and data management, uh, especially by private organizations, this gives rise to greater concern, uh, particularly over two things. One, transparency, and the second one, uh, control over personal data um, and, and over such uh, technology, including AI itself. As accessibility and processing of PD, uh, personal data gets easier and faster, so are the concerns over data subjects control and rights. And this gives rise to greater focus on the implementation of uh, what we call ethical principles and the development of human-centric AI, both to, both to re-establish control by the individual over personal data, as well as to provide some governmental oversight, regulatory oversight, and institutional uh, oversight as well, through governance and accountability. Now, there are two general approaches to the, in response to the above. Right? One is to restrict the collection, use, and, and sharing of personal data, including the, right, uh, including the right to object to the processing of personal data, such as uh, through profiling and even greater restrictions to uh, automated in individual decision making, including profiling. We've seen this done in GDPR, Article 22. Um, and then, the, of course, you, uh, you elevate the right to transparency, elevate the right to be informed. Again, these are on the GDPR. Now, the other approach is uh, really uh, to elevate the right to control, such as to provide individual greater rights in terms of transfers. Uh, Singapore is discussing adding data portability rights in our, in our law, and it's probably going to be included in the, in the next amendments. And, and we see this in Article 20 of the GDPR. And of course, the usual access, uh, right to access, right to correction, and the right to erasure, the right to be forgotten as well, which is not going to be in Singapore law anytime soon. So these are the, some of the concerns. And the main concern really is, um, how do we re-establish control uh, even as we utilize AI you know, to, to manage and handle data? But we have to remember this, right? AI can be used by data collectors, but it can also be used by regulators and data subjects as well to control the use of personal data. So for example, AI can be developed uh, to investigate and detect a personal data collection use and to report such collection and use and to restrict or prevent the same as well as any transfer of personal data. So, uh, I mean, there are some ways that you can do it, right? I mean, the, the, there's a personal information management systems that individuals can use to, to store and manage the personal data in a secure local online storage system and control who they share it with. And un un unauthorized access can also be, in a sense, regulated through prohibitions by law. Now, in Singapore, we have the Computer Misuse Act and online security providers and advertisers have to interact with the data subjects through uh, the, 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 the PIMS, which is the Personal Information Management System as well, in order to access and use personal data. So we have laws, uh, the CMA and even uh, the, the uh, Cybersecurity Act where it's applicable to deal with uh, any uh, unlawful um, sort of access to personal data as well. So these laws, of course, all offer a buffer protection, but there's a, a, an additional level of protection that we need, right, by bringing in all these ethical principles that have been developed over the years, uh, over the last couple of years, in fact, uh, you know, through, through uh, you know, different organizations, through regional organizations, and even uh, different uh, countries themselves. I mean, in Singapore as well, we already have uh, the ethical guidelines um, on, on, on AI usage. And even in Singapore, it's gone down to the level of industry-specific ethical guidelines as well. I mean, we've seen this in, uh, in relation to the, the ethical guidelines that have, were promulgated by MAS, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, uh, which issued a set of principles known as FEAT, F-E-A-T, to promote fairness, ethics, accountability, and transparency in the use of AI and data analytics in the finance industry. And uh, I expect that there will be more sectoral level um, guidelines, right, that will be distilled in, in each industry, especially in the healthcare industry and in, 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 this, in social media in the years to come. 
So we need to we need to recognize that there's these ethical principles and they need to be distilled into law. Now, uh, the, the, the other challenge is really to make sure that it's consistent. Of course, a lot of these principles are quite similar, but how it appears in the legislation itself, I think there needs to be a lot of discussion between um, not just between industries in a particular country, but also between different countries as to how it's been implemented. I mean, one of the things we do at the center is to have discussions with our counterparts on how these things are going to be implemented. A lot of it is still at sort of the, the guideline stage. You know, we talk about general, general um, ideas, general principles, but at a certain point, uh, these guidelines will have to go and you know, to be distilled into the law itself, and, and also in how uh, technology is to be developed and operationalized. Because one of the biggest challenges is uh, technology developers tend to just develop first and then after that, uh, you know, they face regulatory pressures and they face regulatory hurdles as well. So how do you get around that by ensuring that all these principles and all these regulatory tools come in at the, at the stage when um, the technology and AI is still being developed so that when it's operationalized, um, you know, there will not be any issues or problems in terms of implementation. So those are just some of the thoughts that I, I want to share. Um, and I want to just take about three or two, four minutes just to talk, uh, just to give you five predictions on the future changes to the global uh, data protection regime. First, uh, I expect there to be increasing dialogue between regional organizations, right, to mutual recognition and enforcement of data protection obligations. You've seen, right, just discussed this in the, in the context of, um, you know, in the context of the, 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 the APEC rules already, and also to try to formulate, uh, formulate baseline requirements. I mean, uh, you know, there's been some discussion earlier on about the SRAMS decision. I won't, we're not going to that, but the problem with this, um, with this approach there is that it seems to reach, uh, in, in an attempt to sort of harmonize, you know, uh, data protection rules and, uh, and laws, uh, you know, in that attempt to do so, and by striking down some of these uh, uh, sort of country to country arrangements, uh, I feel that there may be more fragmentation rather than, uh, you know, convergence in terms of, of, of people coming, you know, countries coming together to form uh, um, sort of rules that they are, they're, that are consistent and that they can all agree to. And the second prediction is, I think that there will be uh, increasing discussion uh, at the global level right, to see whether or not uh, there can be at that level uh, some form of uh, a harmonization exercise and to try to maybe also harness uh, uh, ethical principles to AI and regu regulatory reforms that are consistent as well. Because this is the one that's being developed, so why not start with uh, trying to have a consistent uh, you know, a set of ethical principles that's put into law and then work backwards and, and deal with the existing, uh, sort of the existing uh, obligations uh, that have been around for so long and that probably requires a little bit more effort in terms of um, the for cons to, to ensure consistency. There is a greater need for consistency in the application of these ethical principles. And so, um, you know, it may require changes to existing obligations, especially in relation to transparency and explainability and the, the sort of the consent notification requirements that form the foundation of the DP regime. And, and uh, fourth, there will be increasing pressure on personal data rights to concede to public interest concerns. Uh, this is in, in, especially in relation to health and movement monitoring. Uh, we've seen this happening this year, uh, you know, where there's increasing um, you know, methods in, in which, uh, you know, our movements are being monitored, our health are being monitored, but that's based on the public interest uh, you know, argument that we need this, uh, to, we, need, we need to harness technology, we need to harness AI, and we need to collect this kind of personal data um, in, you know, in order to control this situation, this pandemic. So AI, as you know, can facilitate collection of and, pre and take preemptive action against spread of uh, viruses and infectious diseases. It can also be used to track, uh, like I said, human movement and traffic, which is a primary focus of containment once the virus is in the community. And the concerns here is around the use of devices and apps, right, such as the safe entry app that we have and the national digital check-in system that we have uh, in private establishments in Singapore for the benefit of, uh, of our, our friends overseas. Um, and also the, the Trace Together app. And now they are also introducing a dongle as well for you to carry around. So in a way, these kinds of apps and applications is being implemented in a way that sort of localizes the data, but not in the country, but localizes it in the device itself that the individuals carry. Uh, and, but, uh, and, and these are encrypted as well. So as long as it's encrypted and it's kept by the individual for a certain time frame, uh, and, and for, in relation to this information that's being, uh, being collected by Trace Together uh, for, for movement purposes, purposes, I believe it's for 25 days after which it's erased. This is one, one way, one method in which you can collect personal data 
and then keep it and only uh, access it for use if it is necessary to do so. Um, of course, there are still security concerns which can be dealt with under the existing laws, under the PDPA as well as the Computer Misuse Act, and in including some penal code provisions. But, uh, but this is one way in which maybe you can contain information you know, in, a, in, in, a, in an environment where we're actually collecting a lot more and we are utilizing a lot more information as well. And uh, last but not least, I think there'll be greater emphasis on privacy by design. Uh, including the design of AI, which will make it more efficient for operationalizing technology for data processing. There are the greater emphasis on digital uh, differential privacy, a system for publicly sharing information about the data set, uh, describing patterns of groups within the data set while withholding information about individuals in the data set, and other methods of eliciting useful information from data without involving infringing privacy rights and interests will also be something that will be looked into a lot more by private organizations. This will have to take into consideration, of course, the developing technology sophistication that may allow re-identification despite uh, pseudonymization uh, efforts and also even anonymization efforts as well. So these are just some things that um, I think I, I'm throwing out a lot of issues more than, more than the answers because not, we don't have a lot of answers to these things. But I, think, I hope that there will be more discussion uh, after this in the Q&A, all right, whatever time we have left, and also beyond, uh, beyond the discussion uh, for today. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Warren. It's certainly a very interesting uh, take on, on, on uh, AI and technology and your predictions. I'm just wondering whether you're prophetic. Um, now, I think uh, let's, let's um, have some time for Q&A. Uh, for the participants, I think we, we started about 10 minutes late. So if I could just, uh, uh, I mean, I think maybe we could, we could just extend the time by another 10 to 15 minutes. I think um, then there'll be some time for some questions and answers from you as well. Uh, so uh, please, I would like to open the floor to our participants. Uh, please identify yourself. You know, you can unmute your mic, uh, switch on your video and post the questions. Alternatively, you can type it in and then we will take it from there. I, I have a first question actually from, uh, from one of the participants uh, who typed it in uh, who, um, and, and uh, his question was, um, given the disparate approaches of the EU, US and other big players, uh, is, what agreements are likely to be achieved at the international level? And I'm just wondering whether uh, any of our panelists will be uh, able to answer this question. Well, I may, I may, I may try to, 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 to address it. Uh, on international level, currently there is no appetite for multilateral agreements. Therefore, the focus should be, as, uh, as, as it was spirit of our discussion, to implement existing uh, tools and mechanisms. Uh, Boyana mentioned uh, the Convention 108 and uh, Rajesh, the all instruments that exist on different level, Warren as well. Uh, and to prepare gradually on academic policy level, uh, this shift from the oil to environment. Therefore, it will take some time. We live in the phase of the digital real politic, which means that, uh, that uh, there are bilateral solutions. Uh, people make a shortcuts to, in order to uh, gain control of assets, uh, data and whatever. And uh, that, that will be, I, I would say that it would get a bit worse than before it gets better. But I think there is an important role of academic community policy researchers to develop narratives and to develop thinking for the considering uh, the public good aspects, including data and AI as a public good. This is extremely important. Uh, in the context of UN, there will be discussions, but as you know, UN is what their member states want to be. And if there is no interest among member states to have the, some sort of arrangement, it will be difficult. Good news is that tech companies and industry are realizing that they have to do something. Therefore, there will be a push, uh, hopefully from all the countries, including in particular US and China, but also European Union for, from the tech sector to act as Boyana said, as responsible uh, citizens and actors, which are, will look for the profit, which is their raison d'etre, but also for the public good. That's basically, I would say, scanning of the horizon currently. Uh, Rajesh, yeah, I, I, I totally agree as well with the professor uh, that uh, the multilateralism is, is going to be hard, especially in the current climate. What, what we are seeing uh, Singapore try and do is a lot of bilateral related arrangements 
in particular the digital economy agreements that we're trying to put in place uh, to encourage digital trade uh, and between different jurisdictions. And I believe that while well, this is not explicitly stated uh, in, in, in very much detail, uh, there will be plans to look at how we can harmonize data transfer for the specific purpose of enabling e-commerce, for example, between the jurisdictions. So you may want to look at the digital economy partnership agreement that Singapore has with Chile, New Zealand, and with Australia, and the current uh, discussions that we're having with Korea. So I believe bilateral arrangements may be one way in which we can achieve this uh, exercise. So if I can just add, if I can just add to that, um, and I apologize, I will have to leave after this because I have another webinar starting. So. Um, the way forward is not going to be multinational because it's, it's uh, multilateral because we will all go completely gray and, and retire by then, maybe one day. But I think we have to work with what we have got at the moment. Um, and that is more regional. So I think within Asia, APEC cross-border privacy rules, I think are an interesting concept. And then we have to look at it into what I call interoperability. So how do you make sure that we can build bridges between, for example, GDPR and APAC, cross-border privacy rules um, system? And there is a possibility because GDPR talks about certifications being uh, a transfer mechanism, for example, uh, or, or if a company certifies with APAC CDPR, maybe they're to be seen as a trusted company and therefore we can share data with them. So we need to build this interoperability bridges um, in the spirit of, of driving convergence and in the absence of really long-term multi, multinational and multilateral solution. Um, and I, I'm also, uh, optimistic that some global companies are going to be pushing the bar because so what happens what i'm seeing is that global companies who operate across number of jurisdictions they're setting their own privacy standard at a certain level which kind of looks like reasonably high but not the highest and that's what they behave that's how they behave that's what they apply globally and then they do the outliers you know south korea may have a particular consent or china here or gdpr there but in general, they try to do similar things. And I think that the power of multinational is going to also keep pushing the laws to converge more. And certainly that's what we do at CIPL. We're trying to get that convergence, but in the meantime, let's build the bridges. Thank you very much, Boyana. And uh, I understand that you might have to leave uh, soon. So um, uh, I think we have time for two, two more questions. So um, is there any question from the floor? Hi, sorry, I'm slow at typing. Can I ask a question, uh, boys? Sure, please. Yeah, hi. So we've been talking about maybe at least achieving some form of consistency, at least among the countries or maybe in the region. What I was, here, what I was thinking about is, do you think this might really be hard considering that at least for some countries or even the history of uh, personal data security and privacy is more of a fundamental human right or a constitutional right, where maybe for some countries this there is a fundamental right to privacy, whereas for other countries, it's not the case. So I guess my, my question is, do you think maybe it is fundamentally hard to achieve some form of consistency? Um, thanks for the question then, I think, uh, Professor Jovan, you want to take that? Sure, I may, I may just make a quick, quick reflection. If we go for the least common denominator, we will uh, waste our time and it will take too long. I would go for some sort of functional denominator where countries can engage regardless their differences, let's say between EU and Asia when it comes to data and privacy protection. But ultimately countries will have to make uh, hard choices and they have to make a trade-offs because if you want to be part of the global economy, if you want to uh, achieve economic developments, you will have to see how to make a balance between some sort of, a, some sort of regulation. It's not always yes, no, there could be win-win solutions when you can achieve both, but in some cases it will, uh, it will be the, the sort of difficult to 
achieve therefore two points. One, let us not go for the least common denominator, it won't lead us anyway. Let's go for functional denominators. And second, be prepared for difficult discussions within countries worldwide, which will be soul searching. What do we want to achieve? To facilitate development, societal, economic, by being part of global community, and data is the chief lubricator of this exercise, or basically to look more uh, inwards and, um, and um, basically contain the sharing of data. Now, again, it doesn't mean that privacy protection and sharing data cannot be uh, put in the same story, but in some cases it will be, it will be challenging. Or Uh, thanks very much, and um, I'm just wondering whether there's any final question from the floor. I, I see there's a question from Abhishek Mishra, uh, and the question is um, for international organizations and UN organizations, uh, do you see a separate framework coming up for them? Um, and I, I'm not sure whether um, the question is whether there are any data protection laws at, at, at the international organization level, but um, that seems to be my understanding of the question. Uh, and if, it already, if such a framework uh, already exists, um, uh, I guess um, we would like the panelists to, to elaborate on what this framework is. I think this question might be better to be answered by uh, Professor Joven also, if you're able to. Sure, the, the answer is, is uh, short answer is uh, no. There is no comprehensive data regulation covering different aspects. There is within the covenant, the UN covenant on human rights, there is a provisions on privacy protection. This is more or less that you have on the global level. Then you have on regional Council of Europe instruments, you have regional, regional instruments. Is it likely to have it soon? Um, the short answer is no. Uh, uh, what we can, there are some initiatives like human rights, uh, Rapporteur on data argued for the surveillance convention to in a way contain the power of the of the of the surveillance agencies national and and private that hasn't been um, uh, well taken by policy by countries that was, that was the last i would say attempt to do something on global level therefore i'm i'm rather pessimistic that we'll have something functional soon Um, I hope that answered the question, uh, but uh, in any case, I, I just want to, I think it's uh, 10 minutes past six, I thought that maybe perhaps if I can just wrap up, um, I'd just like to thank our panelists for a very interesting discussion this afternoon. Um, it is truly a fascinating area to me, uh, there are many dimensions to it, and I'm afraid that we might have raised more questions than provided the answers. But I think the main takeaway at least is that, um, that there are many gaps to be filled still. And it seems to me that uh, internationally or multilaterally, uh, uh, states are not ready yet to uh, come up with multilateral rules. And it seems, uh, at least the consensus seems to be that perhaps the better way forward at this stage is to uh, come up with bilateral approaches and regional approaches uh, for more functional uh, rules or interoperability. Um, I just want to also mention that um, there's this roadmap for digital co cooperation that's been issued by the UN Secretary General. Uh, and among the many initiatives, um, uh, the Secretary General has proposed to promote best practices on AI standardization and compliance efforts. So I think that goes to one of the predictions that Warren, you, you mentioned. And um, I think this is also exploring um, a broad statement, an overarching statement with other member states uh, to see whether it was possible to come up with some elements of common understanding. But anyway, it remains to be seen how these efforts will, 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 will come to fruition uh, and also uh, to what extent they will um, uh, affect or impact business operations and daily lives uh, going forward. Uh, that, that's my, that's just a quick summary of, of the discussion we had this afternoon. It was certainly very interesting. Thank you everyone for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the webinar. 
I wish we had more time, uh, which could have taken two hours for it because I'm sure there are many questions. I have many questions still, but time does not allow us to, uh, to raise them. Finally, just one administrative matter. Uh, we will be sending you a survey form to fill up. Uh, this is required by the Singapore Institute of Legal Education uh, to, to, uh, as, uh, to, for us to, for them to issue one uh, CBD point uh, for, for, for this uh, seminar. So um, just want to thank you all for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, have a good evening, everyone. And please look out for the publicity material for our next webinar. Thank you. Okay. See you, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our eminent speakers, our moderator. If you enjoyed this seminar today, please do check out the CIL website for recordings of our past events. Thank you very much for joining us today. Goodbye. Bye-bye.